I welcome you to Akili Africa and so it's a blessing and an honor to come to you here right out of Kampala, Uganda and today I have a guest with me his name is going to be revealed to you in a short while but as you know these conversations that we have here at the Akili Africa fireplace are all about sitting with leaders sitting with thought leaders and innovators change makers people who have insights that will take africa forward that is what we are all about and today with me is a guest that i've been trying to have for a very very long time but he's been he's been busy uh, in the startup world and i'm going to allow mr david okui to tell us a lot more about himself mr david okui i welcome you to akili africa uh, thank you Thank you very much for telling Yeah, so uh, people are excited to know about you. And even as you introduce yourself, introduce yourself in such a way that you tell us what captures your heart, what makes you cry. But tell us about yourself. Right. Um, so I'm David Okui. I, um, I want to call myself an internet inter entrepreneur. An and internet entrepreneur. Yes, internetpreneur, mm. or internet entrepreneur. Mm. Yes, and um, I think that um, I like to build things. I'm a creator at heart, really, and that's what really drives me. I want to solve problems, uh, build solutions, and then see them scale. That is really what gets me excited uh, when I wake up in the morning and uh, when I get to bed at night. Um, I primarily use the internet as the driver because that is also what I'm passionate about, what I'm interested in. Um, um, from, uh, no, I wouldn't say from a, an early age, but let's say from high school. Well, as I was going to say, if you say from an early age, <laughs> are you saying as old as the internet? But yes, tell us more about that. From roughly high school, uh. Uh, I got uh, interested or really hooked to computers. I was fascinated. That's the word I'm looking Which for. school is this that you went to which has computers in your high school? Uh, that was Busoga College, Mary, uh, in the early 2000s. And at that time, the internet was be beginning to take off. And we were, we were actually fortunate enough to have the internet at school. At, at Busoga College, Mary? Yes. It Those was. were the days of the dial-up. Yes, it was uh, dial-up. Actually, we had a satellite, Vsat di dish, a huge one at school and I think uh, we were supposed to supply other schools. I don't know what the arrangement was, but we're super, super lucky to have the internet in the early 2000s. That's 2000, 2001, 2003 and all that. And of course, not all of us had access to it, but you just had a glimpse of what was to come. And as one of those kids who really saw the light you know what was coming i wasn't hooked to the internet because i mean you have just a few computers maybe 10 computers to roughly 1000 students so you didn't really have time to explore however once in a while you could get to browse using netscape that was the browser netscape. back in the day yes oh, that's quite a while Before i've never internet. used netscape bro. it was installed at the computer labs <laughs> <laughs> well, i remember about about computers in the Mui in the Mui computer lab for those of you who didn't know we went to the same schools both in Mui and amiliango and that's how i remember is i couldn't go beyond dos yeah yeah the, the dos system yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, then that was what windows 98 95 95 95 98, 95, 98. in there 2098 was a big deal yes 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 and people want to know, they've had the word floppy disks. Yes, yes. Tell us about that. I mean, you're saying that here you are, a kid in your early secondary school, seeing the future of the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, given the exposure from your school. Yeah. But kind of take us through the 20 years journey as you've seen it. Yeah. From 2000, this is now 2022. Yeah. Take us through that journey for someone who does not understand for example, what a floppy disk was. Yeah, yeah. So a floppy disk is the safe icon on <laughs> on almost any uh, program that you use on your computer. So the that icon, that yeah, thing. Yes, that one. The cassette icon. That is the floppy disk. It used to be a real. It used to be a real floppy disk. Someone said and it's it funny how it was a disk which is not which is not round. <laughs> <laughs> it was round inside. The magnetic strip was, uh, was mm. round, and it was 1.4 MBs 
uh, in capacity. So 1.4 MBs. Yes, not even the size of your uh, song, let's say. So uh, it was a big deal. It was really huge, of course, back then. And that is what we used to save our classwork on. I think every kid had one. And the, the, the computer uh, teacher is the one who used to keep our floppy disk on our behalf. You guys were lucky. I got my, <laughs> my first floppy disk in 2006 in my senior six vacation <laughs> while working at Power FM. No, sorry. All my proposals were on there, but man, if it got corrupted, that was the end. <laughs> But these, these are struggles people yeah, don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So from the floppy, what 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 what, what happens now with in the uh, journey? Yeah. Of so uh, internet, the, it, it really computing was predominantly offline back then. So you do your work, save it on a floppy on the or on the computer hard drive, mm. and then uh, you know you would uh, come back the next day and boot from where you had uh, ended from. Of course, today now we use the cloud. If you're still saving. Uh, your documents to your computer, then I don't know what's going on. <laughs> you know, <laughs> someone asked me, yeah. what is a cloud? Yeah. And how would you best explain the cloud to a child? Yeah. Even before you give me your answer, for me this was my answer. Okay. I told them that the cloud is that office where there are angels sending those messages on Facebook of, if you love Jesus, <laughs> click like <laughs> and share. <laughs> and this, and this will happen to you. But now, yes, tell us more about the cloud and, and, and what opportunities <clears throat> is uh, this cloud computing? Because you're telling me 22 years to come from the floppy. Yeah. And w which is physical and tangible saving space. Yeah. To now uh, memory space which you can't see. Yeah. So you trust in the system that you put a file in the clouds, yeah. probably where these Jesus angels are sitting <laughs> and they're watching over it. Yeah. And being sure that if you, if you lost something, it will come back. Yeah. Yeah. What, 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 is, what has enabled, what has changed? What has enabled this shift? Okay, so what has uh, enabled that shift is literally the internet. And not just the internet, but fast internet. And that is, we came from uh, dial-up to, at least for us, uh, to 2G, 3G, uh, to 4G now, and now uh, MTN and other companies are rolling out fiber across Kampala. So now we're talking fiber, and maybe the next evolution will also be uh, satellite internet using uh, Starlink and all that. So it may be a combination of all the three. So you have internet being beamed from the satellite up. You have internet running across uh, using fiber. And then you have internet on your phone through 4G or 5G. Uh, yeah, so a combination of all those data pipes are making your data live in the cloud, which is literally uh, just a bunch of computers uh, set up in a data center somewhere. And they are storing your, you know, Facebook timeline, uh, photos, uh, your WhatsApp chats and all that so that you don't have to worry about losing your phone or your computer and everything else goes with it. Literally, this, this uh, data is stored on those remote computers and your phone is sort of like a, a gateway to it, one interface to it. So when you lose one phone, it doesn't matter. You can literally just buy another phone, sign into your account and everything just comes back in. So that's, that is where we are right now. I found that to be advantageous compared to the days where we used to keep phone numbers in phone books. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. get a diary, like a black book, and you write yeah, people's numbers. Oh, on the SIM card. On the SIM card. Oh, you know what was really dope that I've been thinking about? That there was a time yeah. when we used to save numbers in our heads. Ah, uh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so do you think that this has been for the betterment of our heads? Of our... Of, 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 um, our brain space for that for, for that matter the internet you could think of it as an extension of your brain it's sort of like um uh your external brain let me say yes and i like the example you you gave that back in the day you'd actually cram phone numbers in your head and you know you could uh, type them back in uh on let's say phone booth you know 
Uh, you remember the phone booth? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Or public uh, telephone or whatever it is. And actually... Or yeah. the canteen ladies' exactly. phone, yeah. Now, I, 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 I can tell you that I probably have one or two phone numbers in my head. <laughs> <laughs> the rest, I have outsourced the memo that memory part of my brain to... Uh, my smartphone or the cloud so that or Google for that matter so that when I need this information I could retrieve it using that external system <coughs> so more and more the internet is allowing us to use less of ourselves to create more you think yeah it is making you do more with less in the sense that you're concentrating on only the things that really you need to all the things that a computer will not be able to to do so you outsource things like memory uh, storage storing information processing information and all that to computers because they are really good at that and you concentrate on maybe the creative part critical thinking problem solving aspects of, uh, of whatever that you're doing so yeah it has made us smarter and dumber at the same time Funny you should say that. Uh, I found out that in the UK, uh, one of the things that all surgeons have to do uh, as part of their training is they have to take up either puppeteering or knitting or crochet. Yeah. And when I try to understand, what has that got to do with anything? And they said that the reason why they are requiring all surgeons and doctors to take up something that requires their hands to be uh, nimble yeah. is because of the time we spend on our smartphones the dexterity or the, the, the flexibility of our fingers yeah. and the ability to do small things <clears throat> like suturing like if you had to sew up a human body yeah. the average time we spend on our smartphones has reduced our capacity to do that yeah 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 and, and, and that is why I think there are people who have decided to stay off the internet yeah there are people who look at it with, with um, suspicion. Yeah. And this is what we are going to talk about when we come back. About, about the, the, the different things that have been done with the internet mm -hmm. that have been detrimental yeah. to us as a society. And if it was a village debate, uh, this is how they put it. The internet has done more harm <laughs> than good. We'll be back <laughs> after the break and we thank you very much. Back to Akili Africa. And for those of you who have just joined us with me is Mr. David Okui, the founder of Oduka. I do not know how you classify Oduka, but you're going to tell us shortly. And for those who also don't know, David and I share a background that is over what, 22 years now. We were in the same class, in the same schools, and interestingly, our life journey has crisscrossed and intersected around technology. Yeah. And David, I want you to tell us, even in a, as we continue, to, you've, to, you've taken us through your journey of education, you know, and, and how it was on the periphery of technology. I know that you are trained engineer. In electrical engineer. Yes, you are trained electrical engineer. I used to find it interesting how you you guys can really understand the, the Y, the Z, and, 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 and alphabets in mathematics. I don't yeah. have the mind for that. <laughs> so I do appreciate that. But yes, tell us now how this fascination with the internet grew with you, led into your education choices, and eventually has led to your, your work or your profession. Right. Mm. Um, actually, uh, I would say I was very much interested in, uh, let's say, electronics or, or tech generally. Mm. I don't really, I didn't know what exactly it was, but still technology, electronics, gadgets, and all that is, and physics actually, pulled me in that direction. And uh, when it came to academic side, electrical engineering was sort of what was close to uh my passion yeah and uh, as i got through engineering school it didn't really turn out to be the fascination that i had uh, anticipated the electri because, electrical engineer yeah it was what's the difference between electronics 
and uh, like what is electronics and electronic engineer so let's say electrical engineering actually has uh, what's the difference between electricals and electronics let's say okay it has it's 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 all the same but in electrical engineering you have low power systems and high power systems yeah so high power systems is what you see with the national grid umeme power dams power stations and all that stuff and low power systems is uh, what you see with uh, electronic circuits microcontrollers uh, generally you know the uh, consumer tech devices that you see. I'm there. nodding my head and I'm thinking, yes, <laughs> I, may, may, I think I get what you're saying. Yes, yes. And, and, and basically the electronic circuit boards that drive everyday consumer tech, these are low power devices. So that's uh, a difference? Yes, ideally 240 volts below, whereas the other high power things are probably <coughs> in, in kilovolts. 33 kilovolts and so forth so continue your journey as you're yeah. telling us uh so i was very much interested in building things but university didn't really give me that um chance let's say so i was drawn more to the internet because the internet was it was uh, a place where you could actually create you could express yourselves test out ideas uh build build anything that <coughs> excuse me that you wanted and actualize your your ideas and that that is literally what shifted me away from traditional engineering more towards let's say computer science it and technology because with the computer man you can do anything you think of with that device but most most of us <laughs> when we get onto a computer the best thing we can do is do solitaire <laughs> No, no, so no, no. Maybe you need to later on, I think you're going to tell us what are the op opportunities that come with computing. Yeah. As even as you tell us, for now, what opportunities did you find? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So when when I started uh, uh, tinkering around with the internet, that was in university. I literally had to step out of a live lecture room just to go to the, the computer lab and just browse blogs, read blogs, and uh, as you like. <laughs> nah, I can, I can, I can get information on my own. <laughs> yeah, because it was really more exciting for me uh, to do that. And the internet is this uh, sea of information and self-expression, literally, that you can do anything. And the GDP of the internet is about maybe $2 trillion. So is, is that inclusive of crypto? <laughs> I don't know what it is now, <laughs> but before it was about a trillion dollars or whatever. Mm. So if you can just tap a small percentage of that GDP, even 0 0.000, you can put six zeros there. You know, zero one, you, you will be a millionaire. And that is what the internet is. It's this vast ocean of opportunity that if you just tapped a small bit of it, then the value that you extract out of it is exponential. The value that you can add to it is also amplified by this vast marketplace of, uh, you know, uh, e-commerce sites, social media networks, um, you know, computing resources and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So, for you found an opportunity. I mean, you're not alone in having walked out of a, of a lecture because what they were teaching is not what you saw. But tell us now how you come to Oduka. Right. There are people there who are asking, what is Oduka? It's someone's <laughs> name because there is a guy you know, called Oduka. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, well, what's the connection? Yeah. But please tell us the Oduka story and, so, and, and how, you, how you come to this place. Yeah. Because you, you earlier said that the, that the internet is a sea of opportunity. Yes. So I want you to tell us, when did you see? yeah that opportunity and what led you to 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 tap into it all right so uh the i think the first thing that you notice with the internet is that is this rich ocean of knowledge and information that is and misinformation and misinformation that is freely available and that's the key word it's actually freely available to anyone that cares to learn about it so being a university student 
hungry for knowledge and everything, you know, has not limited anymore to the library, the school library or the campus library, which I never visited. Uh, because give you back your library fees. <laughs> <laughs> there's this huge sea of information that you could access. Now, you could have your lecture rooms, but then you could augment them with a lot of other information from YouTube, from blogs, from all these other different sources, and even uh, universities that are out, out there, the MITs and the Harvards and so forth, that could augment on what you already have and amplify what you already know. So that, to me, was a huge uh, it was an eye opener that now you have this thing that literally tells you whatever you want to know yeah so someone is asking uh-huh oduka where does oduka <coughs> come in in all this so and tell us the story don't <laughs> leave out anything because the idea behind akili africa and this show is about finding the african alternative because there are yeah. people who look at africa and think that there's nothing going on in Africa. Uh, yes, they they yes, would be yes, wrong. Yes, yes. And then the Africans who are looking at themselves and they are, they are saying, what else can I do? Yeah. This show is supposed to get that person to say, yes, that is something I've been looking for. So tell us a story <coughs> of Oduka. So uh, I can't tell Oduka's story without telling Dignited, which is a consumer tech blog that spans at least three African countries. That is Kenya, Nigeria, and Uganda. So Dignited.com, if you visit it, Dignited.com is a consumer tech blog and we are there to explain tech and to help Africans make the most of uh, consumer technology. Mm. So the blog is visited by at least half a million people per, per month, close to half a million visitors every month. That's big. Which is, yeah, which is huge. And uh, we've been running uh, Dignited for close to a decade now. And running Dignited uh, is what then inspired me to start Oduka. We were mostly writing about consumer tech, uh, you know, the latest smartphone, all how-to articles uh, for smartphones and, and laptops and all that. But then it still wouldn't be helpful if I can tell you the latest smartphone without giving you uh, access to it, you know, or giving you a means to, to get it. Or, you know, you talk about the one, you know, useful technology, but people that you're writing to don't have access to it. So that is where the idea of Dignited, uh, of uh, Oduka comes in. It is an actual physical uh, product marketplace where you go and order for uh, consumer technology uh, that you can actually use today in Kampala, Uganda here. And, and for example, <coughs> the, I, the tripod that we're using is something that can be bought off. Exactly. Or do kind of lapel mics that we're using. Yeah. So Dignited was introducing people to take information. And then now Oduka was making that take real. Product. Physical. The product. Yes. I, I like the idea of I like the idea of products because you and I uh, share an entrepreneurial journey in that you are one of the the supporters and investors in my agribusiness. And when I came to beekeeping, and I began to look at it in its nascent stage, where it's basic, I kept asking myself, okay, what is the next level to making beekeeping significantly productive? One of the things that I began to contemplate was creating some form of tracking system and a chip that can be put in a in a beehive and it would be it would communicate with us to know what is happening in the hive you yes. know uh, because if you didn't know anything about bees uh, sometimes you wake up and find that the bees that you had in a certain place are gone yeah one of the things that will lead to that is when they become too many okay in in a, in in our in, in the, the hive. hive now because bees really do need and respect uh, personal space when the personal space of a bee which is about three to five milli millimeters 
runs out and becomes one to two millimeters, then the bees will leave. All right. Or sometimes uh, it could be pests. But now, if my bees are 20 kilometers away from me, 20 kilometers? Yes, which is near for me as a person, right? Oh. But let us say, like, my apiary is in Iganga, this is 100 kilometers from me. Yeah, yeah. How do you see the internet coming and being as useful to a, to a, a service or a business as mundane as a Beekeeping. Beekeeping. So it's a part where I'd like you to just share with us the vision of why you see the internet specifically or technology being more applicable to Africa. You know, to someone as small a beekeeper as myself or someone who is growing cassava for the for the <coughs> president's people yeah. in, in Uganda. So when we come back, that's what we are going to, to delve into. What are the opportunities that the internet is presenting to Africa? Right. Yes. We'll be back shortly. Please stay tuned. Yes, hello world. I welcome you back to Akili Africa. Today I'm hosting my friend and my brother, Mr. David Okui, the founder of Oduka and the co-founder of Dignite. And we're talking about finding the alternatives for Africa's transformation, specifically dealing with innovation, technology, and the internet. It's such a fascinating story when I think about it, that having grown up in Mwiri, I saw the, the technology, the, the, the computer center being built from scratch. Uh -huh. And, and um, before, before we joined in my P7, actually P7, P6, I used to go there, and that's when I saw the the the, the DOS, the Windows 95, and how people on what's the latest Windows? 11. <laughs> Windows 11. So people think, people don't know the, the the journey it's taken from Windows 95 to Windows 11. But I think even as we talk about the opportunities, I'd like us to just maybe <clears throat> pick out some milestones. Right. That have followed the internet in Uganda specifically over the 20, past 20 years so that someone can say oh that happened because of the internet that happened because of the internet and that happened because of the internet well that is huge literally you want me to do a history of <laughs> I mean that's also what someone can, can, can see because just now yeah. we're talking about 5G right. let's let's try that out let's try that okay so uh, early 2000s there we are looking at dial-up internet mm. uh, which was in the hands of very few lucky people mm. or institutions like schools you had dial-up which was literally running through telephone lines you had, you had to have a, a, a desktop connected yes. to a computer a modem uh, oh modem I saw, I saw those to things with Uganda Telecom and, man yes Uganda Telecom was doing that and that was limited to where the telephone lines ran and you know telephone lines were really really limited in terms of coverage mm. uh the alternative to that was vsat internet the dishes which were super expensive they were run by highway africa mm. and again this was limited to high-end uh, ngos and government this is also around the time where a phone for you to afford a phone you had to have one million 500k <coughs> yeah cell tell days um so we we then moved from that to late 2000s <coughs> that's about 2008 coming now to 2010 to that decade mm. there was a huge change in there because now uh, the telcos had rolled out fairly a good coverage of uh, mobile telephony and people were making calls and texting so the primary way of connectivity and information was SMS. If you remember the SMS days. Oh, SMS bundles, text texting these, all night. Yes, and even information, you know, you could uh, text I don't know and then send a certain short code to receive news, gossip, yes, what, what yes, not. Yes. And all oh, that. downloading, uh, coloring uh, back calls. Uh, yes. It was a, the the SMS uh, internet of sorts. There's some people who do not know <laughs> that at one time, yeah, the best pastimes besides texting was listening to ringtones. <laughs> <laughs> people okay, don't know that. Earphones. Yes, and it was of course very exciting. Um, and then close to 
uh, when we were closing the decade, the 2000s, we had GPRS or Edge or 2G. Mm. And if you had a fairly good phone, a Motorola or I one, had of, one the, of those. Yes. yes. One of the uh, slightly mid range Nokias, not mm. the popular uh, 2300, was it? This was a time also of the Palm. The yes, yes, but this was there we are talking high-end stuff. Blackberry, you're going really high-end. Yeah. yeah, but I'm talking about easy, cavity, mm. you know, teacher phone, but with GPS. There was a the time it was Samsung that was running yes. that show. Yes, and so the internet here was primarily through WAP, if you remember WAP days, and it was just very basic web pages with links, and you had to use the phone's keypad to scroll through. It was really exciting because I remember downloading wallpa Thank wallpaper. Thank you. Wallpaper. <laughs> wallpaper. <laughs> <Are> you <tr> <laughs> it, was, it was like 2KB and it could cost like 500 shillings, which was expensive, but at least I could change my phone's internet, my phone's uh, wallpaper. wallpaper and all that. Uh, but then something changed around 2010, 2009, the advent of 3G transformed everything that, that was a, a switch a mega switch and would you put that together with the advent of the iphone yes now that is 2007 iphone in the us of course it's not yet here it took about two years three years for that to trickle down android launched about the, the next year or the same year uh 2008 the htc one uh, so by the time smartphones trickle to africa with uh, if you remember the who are we ideos yes, yes partnership yes. between google and, and android and, and uh, android or who are we that was about 2013 that's when i got my first smartphone you know but in between there there was a 3g launched and remember we, we used to access internet through uh, the 3g dongles the ones you plug in onto your computer and it's been a while since access. i last heard the word dongles dongles yes. was also a thing <laughs> Yeah, so I would say that... I think around that time I was using my a BlackBerry. I, I got my first BlackBerry in 2010. Wow, yeah, high-end high user. Yeah. So 3G was a huge like transformation. <laughs> 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 and now with uh, 3G and smartphones beginning to trickle in, mm. in and now early 2010s, uh, you had a, a revolution. Because now it made social media possible uh it made facebook possible twitter possible pinterest and all that and now it made connectivity literally just exploded I, at that point I, I, I was on twitter and i saw someone uh say that in 2007 he remembers going to namasua yeah. while internet cafe yeah and paid two thousand shillings yeah to change his Facebook, his Facebook <laughs> <laughs> profile picture. For, yeah, for those of yeah. you who don't understand how yeah. drastic or how dramatic that is, that yeah. someone had to go to an internet yeah, yeah, cafe, yeah. pay two thousand yeah. to change, uh, or just to check email. Uh, the other detail I left out is actually worked in an internet cafe in my uh, senior six vacation. Mm. Yeah, before joining university. And it's amazing what people would come to do at the internet cafe. You know, because people would you walk said it's miles. a sea. Yes. So people come to, 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 to the sea. What were the, what were the, what were some of the things people were searching? It was free, primarily email. So people would come just to check if they have uh, an email response, and also to send email. Uh, collaborate with pen pals. Pen pals are the big. big now that you mentioned pen pals <laughs> or pen pals, do you think that the internet killed the post office? Uh, in some sense, email, let's say, at least killed the post post office in that in that sense. But when it comes to physical letters, documents, and all that, post office is still very much relevant up to. So today. let's let's continue. Twenty thirteen, ideas comes its its phone. <coughs> what what happens next? Because I remember in twenty in twenty eleven, I was working that time with Wari Telecom. Yeah, and we launched. 3.5G. Yeah, yeah. It was a massive deal, Russ. Right? Yeah. Like yes, it was yes. a really, really big deal. I remember we spent so much money yeah. taking out ads. And I, then uh, one 
of my clients came to me and said, we want you to develop a campaign yeah. where people can access Facebook using USSD. Wow, it's crazy. For those of you who don't know what that means, <laughs> what that means is that anyone who had a capability phone yeah. or a feature phone would go and have to dial uh, star 187 yeah. hash yeah. and then go through that process. Was it possible though? It was possible, but the problem was, the reason why you refused to touch it was because there was something that you could do on your phone yeah, or on yeah. a computer. You either had yeah. to have a smartphone yeah. or that. So, it now, if you notice, this is a time where people now began to have two phones. Yeah, yeah. Duo, duo uh, SIM. That was before the, the, the duo SIM phones. If you couldn't afford a duo SIM phone, you had two phones. Oh, yeah. You had the smartphone yeah. and the feature phone. Because we are still talking about this timeline. Of the internet and the different opportunities that have come so imagine this was 2011 we're talking about 3.5g and you said it, it it was a massive turning point can you Huge. can you connect that with mobile money because mobile money was also not very far within that time yeah M M Pesa had already launched in kenya through safaricom about about the same time slightly earlier uh 2000 maybe seven eight around there and uh, MTN started rolling out mobile money uh, about 2000, let's say nine, nine I think. Or, or so. But it wasn't really big at all. Uh, but it, it really caught on uh, with massive advertising, you know, of course, with the muscle that MTN has. It literally, you know, uh, pulled it off quite successfully until people realize that you know i could actually send money within just minutes to people uh, up country to my friend who is uh, you know in a fix or something like that within in just an instant so i think that was a revolution in financial service delivery in in, in africa mm. let's say yes learning from kenya and uh, transposing those um uh, the solutions. Le yeah, solutions and lessons to Uganda. It was a massive leap. And at that time, uh, it was a time of every solution that you come that would come out of university or any tech solution had a prefix M before it. Oh, yeah. You know, it was M Sente, M, M Pesa, M Duka, M. M, M, M standing for mobile. Yes. <laughs> you literally had to prefix whatever you're doing with an M to signify that it's a mobile solution and you know we were moving into the mobile internet at that point so it was it was quite a time of uh, it was an exciting time but the uh, mobile was limited in, in, in some sense and people were transposing everything into it so mobile is work. something that should connect with 2g yes 2g 3g mm. you know and uh, the mobile internet took off uh, significantly with social media and uh, if you remember the walk to work protest people didn't really know or care what this was 2011 was 2011 mm. and then there was connie if you remember the connie connie, the connie thing, 2012 connie 2012 and the next year and all that mm. so uh, twitter began to make sense this social internet began to make sense because now you had this free flow of information which was moving like a, a river literally in real time and you could know there is an accident that has happened here there is a, a protest that is happening here there is uh, all these crazy things and i think the arabs uh, arab, arab spring, spring yes. was also 20 2011 around that time so you'd get real time information through this uh, feed on your phone on the go while you're in the taxi while you're in the bus and it will come to you at the exact spot at the exact time it was happening and it would that that literally just cut the traditional media channels of news and information flow which were slightly uh, more uh, slow you know TV the TV news came in at you know, at nine maybe. Now you could get it at six. Yeah, <laughs> newspapers came in the next day. But it, this was this these were events happening in real time. Maybe in, in a concert, a Bebe Cole's concert or Bobby Wines or whoever it is, 
and you know you have your friends tweeting uh, you know and taking pictures of the concert in real time and it felt like you were actually with them even if you're not with them at that time so this was a new turn in what the internet was and sort of people understood the value of what this thing was and of course governments too <laughs> well so here you are talking about how the internet revolutionized life as we know it yeah tell that to egypt tell that to libya tell that to tunisia tell that to obama and work to work too you're you're forgetting that work to work was literally happening on twitter <laughs> well it, it's just that the best did it work is a different that. thing <laughs> <laughs> whether, whether it was effective or not yeah but yes you can't you can't deny what happens when information becomes faster than time yeah <clears throat> because that's what the internet has done yeah and it has also democratized information yeah yeah while at the same time creating the risk yeah of disinformation yeah 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 so i want you now to fast forward now we're in 2022 yeah um let us connect let us let, let us connect um the internet technology and the pandemic yeah covid and the covid 19 pandemic and yeah. look at the pandemic uh for what it really was as as um what what's the word a disruption the way that we lived and work and worked and then what the internet did for the world in that time yeah but also where the internet let us down yeah I yeah. want to talk. I want us to talk about that. It's it's a bit broad, yeah, but broad. I want. I, if I know anything, I know that you started Oduka just a year before the the twenty twenty. About the same time. Yes. Twenty twenty. So as your business is taking off, the lockdown happens. Yeah. And two years of our of our of our lives never coming back. Yeah. I want. I want you to tell us now how you scaled through this. Yeah. Using the technology and the internet because that's what we're talking about finding the alternative yeah if something as bad as as uh, the the lockdown and the pandemic happens technology allows us to be able to circumnavigate some of these problems so just take us to that case of how you saw the pandemic uh, as a techno as a te as a te as a tech guru as an entrepreneur as a as a parent as a human being yeah yeah please tell us all right so the 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 pandemic really disrupted life as we know it and no one expected it no one anticipated it uh in the scale in which at least it came mm. i know bill gates had this thing oh, some writers i think uh, <laughs> stephen king yes yes mm. uh but uh those are postulations you know you could say hypothetical okay, yeah hypothetical this thing is going to happen it has a potential to happen but we don't know when it could happen it's mm. like saying an asteroid is going to strike Earth. yes it definitely can and probably will but who knows when and how do you prepare for such an event mm. it's very hard to so it really disrupted life uh people died unfortunately people lost their jobs unfortunately so those are the sad things about the pandemic that happened i lost uh maybe two people that i know almost friends but not very close do you remember when the pandemic was when covid was connected to 5g installations yes yes i want, yes. You, to, I want you to mention that along the way <laughs> I'm coming to that, mm. so, uh, but I just wanted to uh, mention that it, this is not really something that we want to happen, but then it happened. Pandemics uh, uh, happen, it, it, they don't happen very often, but they do happen. And there is going to be likely There'll another be others. one. There'll be others. <clears throat> you, know, you know, it's a possibility and we need to prepare for that. So, um, but that also brought in opportunities at least for us so when the pandemic happened uh, people realized how vital the internet is in trying to 
uh, help us continue with our lives, at least when it comes to work or, or trade or commerce, for example. Because uh, now you're locked down at home, then what are you going to do about work? You know, so people turn to tools like Zoom and Google Meet and collaborative tools like Google Docs, and TikTok, email, I TikTok, <laughs> TikTok for work? No, uh, like for life. <laughs> okay, for life. You know, <laughs> it became Netflix, a hit during. You know, those things. Because you, you're basically saying if, if the pandemic had hap hadn't happened, no one would know Zoom. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I actually wasn't myself wasn't using Zoom that much pre-pandemic. But now people had to use those tools because it was the only uh, solution at their disposal. How are you going to have a meeting? You know, when you're in a lock, when you're in a lockdown, you know, you are separated by time and space. You're here in Chira. Um, I live in uh, Buate, but we have to talk. We have to meet. We have to exchange ideas. What are you going to do? So uh, people had to turn to these tools, and they had to rely on the internet to do that. Now this is where internet providers come in and unfortunately they were not prepared as well. If you remember, the internet was too bad <laughs> for calls, you know. Uh, for I remember, I, I remember Zoom calls were horrible. Terrible. You spend 50% of the time asking the question, are you there? Can you hear me? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. And people just kept on switching service providers but they were all the same, you know. So the Telcos didn't anticipate this, that there was going to be a huge influx of video and audio traffic that's hitting them just beyond, you know, cut videos and uh, Facebook images and all that. This was now, you know, internet on steroids. This was yes. data on, on steroids. In real time, people are making calls, people are video calls, people are making presentations, people are making, you know, uh, business deals and all that kind of stuff. <coughs> So, um, the good thing though is that it took a bit of time, but for the first time, fiber started rolling out. The telcos began investing in, in, the, in infrastructure. And today, MTN, Rock, and a company, I think led by C squared or whatever, uh, Sol is, Soliton. Is, uh, no, it's Sol not Soliton. They're actually called. Uh, uh, cloud and BCS or something like that. Mm. But they are rolling out fiber using uh, Umeme electricity poles. And then they are allowing uh, other internet providers, small internet providers, to actually supply uh, yeah, internet bandwidth to, then. yes, bandwidth to home users. Fiber. This is this fast speed yes we are talking i mean who would imagine i wouldn't imagine fiber to roll out in this city that fast but in two years i've had fiber at home for six months i got onto mtn fiber yes for six months and before that i was using a microwave liquid but it was unlimited so i've been using unlimited for two years Unlimited internet. We are not talking MBs. And, I was last in know? that space when I was still at Smart Telecom. It's yes, we are not talking uh, metered internet. You know, bundles mm. and what, because that's very restrictive uh, way of consuming uh, the internet. It's very limiting. But now we are pushing past that to unlimited internet, where it's just consume whatever you want. If it is Netflix, if it's YouTube, if you're shooting a, a video, a podcast, whatever it is, you're not consciously uh, aware that your internet is running out. No, you're just using the internet. The question know, is for whatever what? you want. And, exactly. And, and, and that is where I want us to come to, <coughs> even as you contemplate this. You see now, with the, we're talking about the pandemic yeah. uh, and, and the philosophy that out of chaos yeah is an opportunity yeah you not create something new yeah i celebrate uh, our friend our mutual friend dr davis Mosenguzi of rocket health yes, yes these yes. are some these are some of the people who were found at the right time yeah 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 at the right place yeah so at that point that's where telemedicine took off exponentially literally because yes. now you couldn't drive to the hospital you had to get authorization letters and i don't know what from the lc the rdc and so forth and so the, the hospital had to come to you 
Yes. You know, so through lo Rocket Health, I, I, I managed to vaccinate my kids because now I didn't have to go to the hospital. The hospital came to me. So these guys would come in bikes and all that and vaccinate the kids. And this was great. And when I wasn't feeling well, I just had to call the doctor on the other side and do some consultation. And if I had to take blood samples, they would come, take my sample, and then uh, send me uh, results via email. And then I would get on a call with a doctor and discuss the results and maybe medication again would come through the online uh, pharmacy let's talk about logistics <coughs> yeah let's talk about logistics because um you see i remember in the year 1992 yeah uh i was that time living in kampala with my aunties yeah and at around 9 p.m we're having dinner uh -huh. news comes in that uh solution your mom has had an accident okay. and what was the accident my mom had had a fish bone stuck oh. she had swallowed a bone and it, she had ended up in hospital but i got this news on a friday but the thing had happened on a what on a wednesday oh, it's two days after. two days but also in 1990 up until i think up to now it still happens for some people but what they call evidango like death announcements death announcements was part of programming radio and radio tv and programming TV. yeah yeah and obituaries, on newspapers. and obituaries in the newspapers i'm i'm you i'm using this to build to, to build a case that there was a time when you had to be on your radio between <coughs> 1 yeah. 30 and 2 yeah between 4 30 and 5 yeah and listen to every death announcement in Uganda, just in case you've lost out, a relative. A relative. Yeah. yeah. That is how information moved. That's how slow it moved. Yeah. And now, just like that, you know what's going on. Just like that, you know what's going on. Just like that, you know what's going on. And sometimes, that is not advantageous if you get the wrong kind of information. Of information. Yeah. Yeah. So now here we are. We're looking at this massive sea yeah of, of information we spent two years without our children going to school yeah and i'm sure you've had time as, as as a visionary to think about what else we can do with with uh information and com and computer technology we've come from the place of sitting at the radio station i'm at the radio and listening to salongo john while eating your lunch <laughs> yeah. to now where you can know something whether it's wrong or yeah, not yeah. in an instant i want you to paint us a picture of what you see that is on this sea of technological innovation we are at the precipice <coughs> or at the advent of, of 5g what do you see coming with this right. good and bad good and bad it's interesting uh yeah oh by the way radio is still uh, the biggest media of uh, <laughs> Uh, the biggest uh, the good thing is now with the internet you can get it <coughs> yeah, yeah yeah i just wanted to put mm. that there but yeah that's that's a very interesting question really like with opportunity also comes a lot of adversity with it uh, i want of course as an entrepreneur i look at what are what are the possi possibilities what are the exciting things what are the uh, you know opportunities in this i look at the positive mostly but of course you have to be co cognizant of what the dark side of this thing that is coming out so yes um you have information at the palm of your hands literally as we said before google is literally our external brain now mm. that we have outsourced a lot of other things you know uh, and that is good because then if you're a creator then you concentrate on the thing that you're building and then only get to the internet to maybe bounce around ideas, get inspiration, or whatever it is. Um, but with uh, great power comes res great responsibility. <laughs> uh, because this information, because the internet has um, brought down the cost of publishing to literally zero, you know? everyone is sort of a media company everyone everyone is, is an expert yeah everyone is an expert everyone is uh 
is an authority. Let's say everyone has a, a voice. That is a good thing. And everyone has something to say. Yes, Whether they should say is, it or not yes, is a different thing. In the free speech <laughs> <laughs> arena, that is an incredible thing. Because mm. before you had to have a platform if you, if you wanted to say something. And you also had to be someone, you know, to be on TV. And it was a big deal, remember? Yes. If you go to TV, oh my God, it was something exciting. But you're still you a know? big deal. That's really <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. You understand. And so it, it was, was limited space. It was limiting, yes, because there are a lot of other people that had a lot to offer, but because they were not ministers or they were No not, one knew them. Yeah. <coughs> you know, they didn't And the have, moment someone sees you on TV all of a sudden. Exactly my point, you know. So it has given everybody a voice and I think it has amplified humanity. It has amplified what we can do. Because then you don't have to ask for permission to get up there and like for example we are doing this podcast and we don't have to get airtime from nbs or ntv or whatever tv station but yet we have substance to offer right yes. at least the viewers hopefully agree mm. so this is what the internet has done it has zeroed down on the cost of publishing so that everybody can get out there and you know say something express themselves and offer value so if you have value then this is uh the amplification that i'm talking about you're literally creating value at an exponential rate it is not now traditional media companies that are doing that it is indie you know creators who are doing that indie musicians if you just get a guitar and you have a voice, just go ahead and start recording and put it on YouTube. Uh, and you know, a lot of people that think that your music is good will uh, subscribe to your channel and you build a fan base, you build, you build an audience. YouTubing <coughs> has become a career, yes, TikToking has become exactly a with career, which, with TikTok, tweeping. <laughs> uh, this thing called influencers. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. a couple of of years ago, if you told your parents that uh, you're an influencer, yeah, be influenced with a slap. Because, <laughs> like, really, you, you you go to school, study yeah, IT, and then you're yeah. an influencer. Yeah. But again, you're saying these are some of the opportunities. Yeah, yeah. That have come through. I see what you're saying. Yes, yes. And there is more to come. Yeah. But you know, this is a show about Africa. Yeah. What do you? where would you say is a strategic gap where yeah. should we as africa yeah pull up yeah our socks and 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 say let us do more because let me use a statistic in the year 2012 when i did a media a media training for yeah. uganda national roads authority i was teaching them in 2012 about the power of alternative media wow okay and i was telling them guys TV and radio only go so far, but this is what's coming next. Now, interesting. In that year, according to my research, do you, do you know how many televisions we had in Uganda? Maybe a hundred. Five hundred thousand televisions. Five hundred thousand. Uh, Five hundred thousand. Wow. No, te not television. Radio, radio stations. Not television stations. Television sets. Okay. All right. Yeah? That in 2011, 2012, Uganda had 400 to 500,000 TV sets as in the number of people can watch TV have to find them have to find TV on these 500,000 but at the same time internet uh, prevalence or accessibility to internet yeah had gone to about 40 percent yeah in 2012 I think now it's standing between 75 to 85 percent mobile uh, via mobile yeah you get because now we with mobile with the, the transitions of mobile from 2g to 5g anyone with a mobile phone now can access the internet the internet so this has happened and yet we do when you look at the sea that you mentioned it seems we are still going there for silver fish <laughs> we're still going to the sea no, 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 of the no, internet the, for small things so i want you to speak yeah. to African leaders, African entrepreneurs, African visionaries, yeah. and tell them, guys, pay attention to this. 
pay attention to this pay attention to this paint us a picture of what you see needs to be done is coming yeah or needs to change okay yes so we will stand with uh, we'll start with the plumbing or the infrastructure literally mm. that has to be, that has to be done and i'm glad that fiber is beginning to roll out but in is, Kampala. Yeah, that's that's bother you always digging up digging up <laughs> this time they're that serious. needs to be fixed this time they're serious they're laying on poles mm. not under mm. Yeah, so it's rolling out seriously, like in my neighborhood, I've seen posters advertising fiber and all that. In Kenya, it's in Nairobi, it's big through uh, Safaricom and uh, Zuku. They are really laying fiber and it's right now the default for some homes. <coughs> I don't know about other cities in, in Lagos, I think they're doing the same, but mostly on mobile. So. <coughs> The, the plumbing needs to happen and is happening. So give it this another... This includes the SICOM cable. Yes, we are, they are landing uh, uh, with uh, uh, Google and Facebook are landing uh, cables across the peripherals of the continent. Mm. You know, from Europe to Nigeria, down South Africa to Mombasa and, and so forth. So they call the backbone. Yeah, so mm. it's happening at least. And when the the, the internet when the the infrastructure is laid you know and you are no longer conscious of 50 mb 100 mb you know those data bundles but now you have unlimited internet with speeds of 50 megabits per second that is like bringing a swimming a, can i say a swimming pool to your backyard you know more than just a basin of water mm. they have now brought a swimming pool you know filled with water what are you going to do with it you know uh so that is what is going to happen or well, that's what happened that, that's what happening in the next five years the infrastructure is being laid at a very terrific speed and this time they are super serious and the speeds are good currently my home speed is roughly 10 mbps Sometimes it spikes to 20 Mbps. I did a no? speed test last this past <laughs> few days. Mine was 5.6 yeah. kbps. Kbps. MTN wet deco. That is bad. But in the next five years, mm. those speeds could be triple or increase to 100 MP Mbps. In the US, they are they are. Uh, homes that are getting one gigabit per second with a uh, Google Home Fiber, one gigabit per second. That is like uh, maybe a hundred times what I'm current my current speeds. So that and yet is for crazy. you, are, apparently your speed is fast. I'm relative <laughs> <laughs> to other people <laughs> and relative to the things that I'm also doing, mm -hmm. it is good enough. I would say it's so a fast. It is good enough. Uh -huh. 10 Mbps is good. But in five years, it could go to at least 100. By the time the kids grow to maybe teenage age, maybe when they're going to college, it will be one gigabit per second plus. And here I'm being conservative. The internet is going to be super fast. But the applications that we are using today are going to feel like using SMS on your smartphone. At that time, we are talking the metaverse. If you've heard about the metaverse, mm. where you the internet is now this virtual 3D space. You get in and and uh, stay for a very long time, and it's virtual 3D space. It's not just an uh, interface. You get on your phone and you're tapping away with the links and you know images and all that it's this huge virtual 3d space where you can literally be in san francisco or new delhi or tokyo and it feels like you're there with a lot of other people but when you're in nigeria but when you're here <laughs> why because the internet speeds the data pipes uh have that capability and capacity so that is something that the kids in 10 years are going to grow up in the internet is going to be radically different from what we currently experience 
So what does that mean? What opportunities are available there? Well, it's kind of hard to tell. But right now we have an uh, influx of you know, cryptocurrency, virtual currencies, uh, virtual goods are a big deal. You know, where you get in there and you're trading virtual goods, games, you know. So as an African, that is something that you can prepare for and create. Create virtual goods, you know, coins, um, games. Uh, avatars and I don't know what so it's kind of hard until you get into this, this world this, and understand this, it. This week you saw a letter <coughs> going around from the Bank of Uganda. Oh, NFCs. <laughs> yeah. Bank of Uganda talking about yes. uh, all, all financial uh, institutions tell them to stay away from cryptocurrency. Yeah. Is this, is this the thinking that we need to have as Africa? <coughs> Not, I don't think you want to be that triggered when it comes to innovations because you don't know what you could miss out you could miss I know, out I know was it entire... Ecuador and Honduras that recently made uh, Bitcoin yes. or cryptocurrency yeah. legal yes 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 so yes. you're saying this is not how we should be looking at things don't be that rigid give space for sandboxes for experimentation give some allowance and say okay you guys can play with these things for to this extent you know but don't completely censor and ban it because you don't know what could it could be so i think that's a wrong approach to approaching uh, unknown technologies and i think that it's quite conservative and very counterproductive thank you yeah. very much now even as we bring this to a close um, as an investor i i would like you to enlighten me on behalf of other investors about which which african tech startups have you been watching and that we should pay attention to and if not we as investors that business support needs to be given to these companies which companies are you watching in africa that are riding this tide of ict in the right direction i think i'll, I'll start with those that excite me the most mm. <coughs> and that is rocket health Mm. Telemedicine. They are the first. They. Uh, I mean, Davis is very crazy. He's a, he's a crazy guy. Um, and I mean, they have uh, built a whole product or service that has never been seen on the market. And they're crazy enough to pursue it, and the odds were in their favor. You know, and now it's beginning to work, and you know, we're having a lot of telemedicine uh, rollout across Africa. I think they. They recently raised uh, five million dollars or ten million dollars or something like that to expand across the continent mm. so i think that is interesting that is useful because i've used their service a lot and i've seen the value that it offers uh instead of going to hospital queues and uh, wasting all this time there i've been getting you know, sicker <laughs> probably getting sicker or whatever <laughs> <laughs> you know the hospital is coming to you at least for certain services that mm. I mean, you can be done at home, like vaccination. Why would I want to get on to jam and, you know, take the kid to the hospital to be vaccinated? That That is something that can be done here. If I'm not feeling well, I'm suspecting malaria, why, why should I have to go to, you know, the hospital? Maybe I could just get the samples taken home and that kind of thing. So okay. that's crazy thinking. Which other one? Uh, uh, the others are in the fintech space because uh, finance is, Africa is still largely disconnected as a continent, at least from a financial perspective and also infrastructure perspective. So there are startups that are laying the financial infrastructure that enables the movement of finances or money uh, across African states quite easily. Now, before we had movement of money uh, or remittances from say the US or the UK to the continent but it was quite hard to move money say from Uganda to Congo or to Nigeria or to Kenya you know <coughs> inter Africa money transfer was barely there you had Western Union which was this legacy financial uh, service provider which took a lot of the time costs. and also cost 
but with these new fintech companies that is beginning to change and in that space uh, <coughs> i'm excited <coughs> excuse me i'm excited about Eversend, uh cheaper uh flutterwave uh paystack uh yeah those guys are doing something crazy of course they are riding on traditional telcos that already built the mobile money infrastructure that is MTN mobile money now MTN yeah it's now the MTN mobile money company it's a separate company altogether and then M-Pesa and then M-Pesa I think is also going to Ethiopia now and you have this uh, whole infrastructure financial infrastructure that is being built now when you have a inf uh, financial infrastructure in place then it means that we can trade easily Yes, logistics becomes easier. Not logistics. Logistics heavily depends on physical infrastructure, which is roads, rails, and waterways. That is, you know, that's a, that's that's a, that's a, that's a man's there is a man's job that way. Yes. So mm. at least for now, when it comes to say digital goods, it is easy to pay <coughs> digital goods and services. It's easy to pay somebody in Kenya or in Nigeria. So like at Dignited, we have a, a team in uh, Nigeria and Kenya that we have to pay, you know. And without this infrastructure, it will be quite hard to be able to remunerate those uh, writers. So with this digital infrastructure, at least we can pay and trade among ourselves uh, digital goods and services you know you can pay a web developer or a mobile developer in lagos you can pay a web designer in uh, nairobi you can uh, pay for a digital art piece or a comic book or a song uh, by a musician in, in uh, lagos and all that so these are digital goods and with the payment infra infrastructure in place then we can easily trade among ourselves as we wait for the physical infrastructure to be built by governments unfortunately that requires governments not startups so when you have like for example we have the congo that has joined the east african bloc now we have to open up uh, trade links and you know roads and rails and you know all this physical infrastructure to enable the movement of goods physical goods this time between Congo and Uganda and Kenya and Tanzania. I was excited okay. in 2019 I went <coughs> to Nairobi. Yeah. And I found a safe border there. Yes, yes. That is a company I'm watching. Yes. Safe border, Jumia. Yes. You know, because again, uh, what we saw with the pandemic. Yeah is that can you get what you need without moving away from your house yeah you know and personally though, though my, my my bet is on those companies and when we when we think about the gaps that uh exist because business does not exist in a vacuum no there is a man with a heart yeah. in a high building who is supposed to pay for the roads yeah. to happen who is supposed to pay for the for the railways to happen and I have postulated what I call the solution 6i model for transformation. Yeah. Is that any society, any country that focuses on these six things is definitely on its way to transforming itself. And the first one is imagination. Yeah. You know, just changing the way that we look at ourselves, we look at life, we look at, uh, at the community. And you find that imagination is a function of education. So before we change anything, we have to change. The education and the way that we turn up to learn yeah. and the second thing after you have imagined then you have to invest in institutions yeah you get that the institutions are there to support the building of an economy and any country without institutions is a house of cards yes it is and then from institutions then you invest in infrastructure infrastructure something as basic as electricity I still don't understand why when the rain comes, the power goes. <laughs> <laughs> I still never understand that, 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 that thing. Now, after infrastructure, you can now do innovation. Yeah. Because the, the basic necessities for an innovator to work, yeah, are there. For example, within this compound of Akili, Africa, you will be amazed to find out that this is where Yunga happens. Yeah. And that here we have, we have internet. 
it's 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 pretty decent because we we are close to um, a booster. But some yeah. days it's five kbps. Something needs to change for yeah. innovators to work. Yeah. Now innovators in invite investment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the institutions protect capital. Yeah. And the infrastructure supports innovators who are working out of imagination. Yeah. Then we can come to industrialization. That is the sixth eye, where we are scaling. That we are coming to a time where Oduka is not just trading in, in, in consumer electronics. Yeah. <clears throat> Why not make? But yeah. the only way we can come to that place is when we have gone through these six eyes. Yeah. And when I look at it, I I think that we are on our way. There is a lot, a lot to be done. Uh, what, what you mentioned Facebook doing with uh, with uh, Google. Google, and now even SpaceX is trying to do yes, yes. to get internet. My only challenge is where we have this sea of opportunity, and we turn up to it with a spoon. <laughs> that would be unfortunate. That would be unfortunate. So on that note, Mr. Okui, it's been an honor, it's been a blessing to have you. And thank you for the insights and, and for the support. Uh, for those of you who are watching us, if you would like to get yourself some of these simple, basic uh, consumer electronics, earphones, earbuds, a tripod, so you can do something like this. The internet is available and you just need one of these things, just have to go to Oduka. Oduka.com. Oduka.com. That is Oduka with an R after an E or after an A. O D U K A R O D U A O D U K A R dot com yeah. and please go on there. The prices are fair from what I've seen. And the solutions are good. I still have my car charger. Yeah. Please. This is how we grow. This is how we do it. One man supporting another. We do this compelled by love for God and Africa. And we are coming to you from Akili Africa as always. Sitting with leaders, sitting with uh, change agents, collecting insights to lift you, to grow you, to bless you, Mama Africa. Thank you. Catch you on our next episode.